Welcome to Dreamcatchers, a series about New Zealanders living in the United Kingdom. I'm Hilary Timmins. This is a series that will enthrall and inspire us as we meet some of those Kiwis living their dreams and taking a little piece of New Zealand to the rest of the world. The Red Arrows have been thrilling spectators for five decades with their dynamic aerobatic displays. One of the founding members was a New Zealander, Ray Hanna, who went on to become team leader from 1966 to 1969. Following in his smoke trail is another Kiwi, Emmett Cox. I'm privileged enough to be, be the seventh Kiwi in the team. So I'm Red 5 this year, but the positions change every year. So last year I was Red 3, it's more up the front of the formation, and then every year you get a bit more experience, the boss gives you a bit more of a leash and you get to, to go in the slightly more dynamic uh, positions. The Royal Air Force aerobatic team, known as the Red Arrows, was formed to demonstrate professionalism, teamwork and precision, and as the public face of the Air Force, promote and provide inspiration both in the air and on the ground for all that makes Britain great. They are a fixture of British summer events with more than 80 displays and up to 100 flybys a year, made up of nine of the very best pilots from the Air Force. So it's all hand-eye coordination um, and using um, the Mark 1 eyeball to, uh, to, to line up things on, on the front jet. Um, so if you're number nine or myself, number five, I have an aircraft in between me and the boss and I'm just focusing on the boss, boss in front. Personally, I, I love the rollbacks. It's the, um, the last manoeuvre you uh, get taught going through your winter training as a, as a new pilot. Um, it's where you, you fly along and you roll around the other, other guy inside you and then he rolls around back to you and you do that several times. It's the most dynamic manoeuvre, so you're manoeuvring the aircraft quite close to the ground um, with quite, um, quite large stick inputs. Um, so that's um, quite challenging to get right, but when you get it right, it's, it's fantastic. Emmett grew up on Auckland's North Shore and his love of flying began at an early age. As long as I can remember, I've always had an interest in flying. Now, I think it probably dwells from the fact that my grandfather was a Spitfire pilot in the war in the RAF. Also, my uncle, uh, who tragically passed away in the Hatfield train crash, was a, was a pilot. Um, and uh, I was influenced by him uh, later in life as well. I tried, to, uh, tried twice to get into the New Zealand Air Force. So the first time was, uh, was straight after high school. Um, always wanted to do it, so, so applied and was uh, pretty disappointed not to get in. But uh, they gave me some good feedback, they said go away and get, uh, get some more life experience and come back and try again, which is what I did. Um, went to university, a lot of time travelling, uh, came back and applied again um, and was uh, unfortunate around the same time New Zealand uh, got rid of their fast jet fleet. Undaunted, this tenacious Kiwi came to the United Kingdom in 2001 and began the six-month selection process to join the Royal Air Force. It was here Emmett would have his first experience of flying and on completing training was selected as an elite fast jet pilot, eventually finding himself posted to the famous Dambuster Squadron. He later moved into fast jet instructing and volunteered to join the Red Arrows in 2014. It's quite a lengthy process and as soon as you get to a point in your career where you have enough um, experience and uh, as deemed as above average effectively, uh, you can volunteer to apply. So that happens and then you get whittled down to a short list of normally about nine people from a selection of maybe 40. Uh, and then from those nine people you go out with the team for a whole week, you do a flying test, you do formal interviews, media work and then also socialising with the team as well. Um, so obviously we work quite closely, trust is a big element, so uh, to do that you really want to know you've got the right people. I never assumed that I'd get in, I was just happy enough to, to finally do uh, some flying on the wing with, the, with Red One, the smoke coming out, I thought this is the best thing ever. And then to find out I got in the team was something else completely. So we do most of the winter training here at Scampton in Lincolnshire and we'll fly three times a day, every day, Monday to Friday and just hone those skills. But it starts off, just like anything else, a really building block process. So. It's, uh, it would be overwhelming if you look at it going, right, I'm going to fly a nine ship today. But we start off as a three, and you work up to a five, seven, and then eventually, four or five months down the track, you're, uh, you're flying uh, as a nine ship, doing the displays in front of the public. We have what's called the flying circus. So the circus is our one engineer we get to work with the whole year. So they'll sit in our back seat, and then when we transit to or from locations, they'll be able to service the jet when we jump out. 
the each jet is subtly different. Each one has a, a slightly different roll rate or performs the engines slightly different as well. Uh, because we fly them you know, three, four times a day, you really start to become in tune with that one aircraft and because of the types of maneuvers we do as well. So ideally, we'll stick to the same one throughout. With his tenure in the Red Arrows and his 16 year career in the service coming to an end, Emmett's flying career may be heading in a new direction. But his determination to live his dream and never give up is marked by many highlights. And there is one particular flyover that this proud Kiwi will never forget. Going through, through training and, and the type of people you work with, such a motivated, uh, capable bunch is, is, is a big highlight to be, uh, be in the military and work in the service. Because flying a jet for the first time was, was a lifelong dream. Uh, and then being, uh, being honoured enough to, uh, to represent uh, the United Kingdom at Royal Air Force in operations over Iraq and Operation Talik, uh, supporting troops on the ground is uh, very fulfilling as well. But for me here at the Red Arrows, it's, it's the absolute pinnacle, I think. You've got to pinch yourself every day. You, know, you give to hard days, but, but it's well worth it. Yes, yeah, like um, when the Rugby World Cup final, for example, flying over that um, with New Zealand versus Australia, I never thought it would be part of an event so, um, so important to me as a New Zealander like that. And that was an incredible, incredible day. Frame Gyms, opened by former New Zealand sports star Joan Murphy and business partner Pip, has transformed Londoners' approach to fitness. Now with six colourful frames across London and high-performance workouts called Bend It Like Barbie and Beyonce Bar, their focus is on the three Fs, flexercise, fun and fitness. London life is super fast and busy. A lot of people are becoming really aware of health and fitness, but a lot of us don't have a lot of time. Um, so I think what our whole thing is, is, is to make it um, achievable for people. And we really wanted to do it differently, so we wanted a studio concept, and our whole concept is based on pay-as-you-go. I mean, we do kind of a bit of everything. So the idea is um, that it's a one-stop shop. So Frame has um, a dance studio, a fitness studio, a yoga studio, and a Pilates studio. So we're kind of everything under one roof. So the idea is that there's variety in um, how our classes are a bit different as it's all freestyle. So they get, um, they get creativity in it, which is really nice, which means clients don't know exactly what they're coming to each time. You know, if you haven't got the right person at the front, there's no atmosphere. So we typically have like actors, um, dancers, um, with a lot of creatives, because they hold a room really well. We do a, a quite a big um, training academy to make sure that they've got the knowledge um, to be able to to instruct safely um, and put, put creative classes together. Joan studied commerce at Otago University and majored in marketing and finance. A sports fanatic, she represented New Zealand in soccer, athletics and cycling. But it wasn't until opening the first frame in Shoreditch that she was able to combine all her skills. Starting a business is quite challenging. Um, I think number one was finding a property. Um, the London property market is insane, um, and we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. I think the, the blessing for us that we were only like 25, 26 when we were doing this, so we were very naive, which was really helpful. Um, Pip and I are both mums, and we have a lot more to lose right now. A bit more risk averse, I guess. This is the first frame we're actually in now. Um, it was an old car park, so it had no plumbing and no power. So I think we just really like convinced them that we, no one else was going to take it. Um, and then we needed to go to the bank and raise the finance. So I mean, everyone knows about raising finance. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but that's where our business degrees really came um, into play. The reason we think that Frame has succeeded to this point um, is all about like passion. So if you don't have like a passion for something, don't start a business because you know you need that passion to drive you when things aren't maybe going as well as you want it to. Um, and you know it's, it can't be all about the money because I think starting a business is really tough. Um, perseverance. So you really need to believe or want to do it. And I think like going back to my sporting days, you know, like I never had. I never could go any further in any of those sports because actually I just really liked chopping and changing and I didn't have the dedication, so you really need to persevere and really believe in that. And then for Frame, it's been people, so it's the people around you. And I think that's no different for anyone else. So when we were starting out, it was all about the people that we asked for advice. It's about the staff that we have. We still have, ask for advice all the time, like starting a clothing range. We don't have any experience in that, so we've got lots of people at Frame and we ask for them. So it's really about people. So, you know, surround yourself with good people, positive people, and uh, you go far. 
But the thing that excites me the most is the volume of people that come and really go through the classes. So I think when we started Frame, I think the English population was really into watching sport, but maybe not doing it as much. Um, and in New Zealand and even Australia, it was really um, as part of our lifestyle and, and we were brought up that way. I think now it's really changed in London, but London is still, you know, a big city and so you have a big diverse population. So you probably don't see it quite as much, but it's very on trend right now. But kind of the goal is I'd like to open like four or five in the next couple of years. Um, and then really sort of try and reach out to a sort of an online audience because we're very much um, a city-based business. But actually I'd really like to take the ethos and the classes um, to sort of the wider, wider population. Next up, we go behind the scenes with our homegrown horsepower on the field and on the track. Sir Mark Todd is one of our most celebrated sportsmen. Voted event rider of the 20th century, he has won two gold medals back to back and represented New Zealand at eight Olympics. He's won badminton four times and Burley five times. And as a member of the New Zealand high performance squad based in the United Kingdom, his legendary status continues to inspire generations of riders around the world, including fellow Olympic equestrian Janelle Price. Watching Mark in New Zealand's Olympic dream team as a horse mad youngster. These are people you've read about and followed and and watched you know your whole childhood so you know to be standing or sort of riding 10 meters away from them in a warm-up or park to them next to the lorry park you know it was sort of quite intimidating and uh, exciting and nerve-wracking all at once I guess. A close-knit and supportive team, despite effectively competing against each other, life on the competitive circuit for our high-performance squad is far from the glamour we see when they are competing. Husband and wife equestrians Janelle and Tim Price have just arrived at Houghton Hall Horse Trials in Norfolk, one of the numerous events on the competitive international circuit that will be their home for the next five days. We're actually just in the middle of a, a, about a six or seven week stint. We literally, yeah, get home to do a load of washing and turn around and go again. But uh, it's all part and parcel of, of the job, of what we do. It's um, a great sort of camaraderie between, you know, if you sort of look around the truck park, a lot of these other people are, are on a similar itinerary. So um, they are some of our best friends. They will be for life. and. Um, we're sort of like travelling gypsies in a way. Obviously having uh, Tim and myself has benefits and, you know, pros and cons. Uh, one of the downside, I guess, is generally it means twice the amount of horses, so it's twice the amount of work, twice the amount of staff. This week uh, we've got six horses here, uh, so most people would possibly have one, maybe two. So that involves two trucks this week. Uh, we've got three staff. So even, you know, cooking each night for the girls. The girls, you know, they work hard, long days, so we try and make sure that they're well fed as well and everyone has a good time. Growing up in Motueka, in a totally non-horsey family, Janelle cut a deal with her mum when they moved to Christchurch that she would begin studying for a law degree at Canterbury University as long as she could continue pursuing her dream of making it onto the New Zealand Olympic team. She never did finish that degree. My first Olympics was, I guess it's technically London, but I went to Athens as a travelling reserve. So that was, I would say, sort of the most pinnacle thing probably that happened for me because it really... Uh, cemented that this is what I wanted to do and it sort of gave me that hunger to move over here permanently. I was just over here part-time leading up to Athens um, and it was post-Athens that I went home, sold everything and moved back the following year. Um, London was uh, the first time I, I actually got to ride myself at the Olympics. Um, I think everyone will agree London was a really special Olympics. There was something very magical about it. Judged on overall score for dressage, show jumping and cross country, eventing is the only code where men and women compete on equal levels and performance is based on another living being. The winning combination of rider and horse is essential. It's not necessarily what's on the outside of a horse that makes it so special. 
you know, sometimes it's as much what's the inside and, you know, perhaps what they might lack in a bit of talent or ability they make up for in determination and and heart. And um, that's where you don't always know at first glance whether, you know, it's going to be a good horse or a great horse. Janelle and Tim rent a farm in Wiltshire and run up to 30 horses between them, not just training and producing horses for themselves, but making a living buying and selling for others. I don't think we really knew what it was going to take to try and foot it with, with the world's best riders in England. Um, and it's been, you know, it was certainly all of probably six or seven years till we got to a vaguely comfortable or desirable place in our lives, sort of from a business or a career point of view. Um, so yeah, it was certainly hard graft for a long time there. And I think uh, you've almost be pig-headed about pursuing your dreams. You know, there's, there are too many things that can stand in the way if you think about it for long enough. So I guess just keep it very simple, what it is you want to achieve in, in this game or in this world and uh, be determined about achieving it. And whenever there's a, a stumbling block in the way, just find a, find a way around it. And if you're persistent long enough, one day it will happen. New Zealander Bruce McLaren is an icon of high performance sport and the McLaren Automotive and Technology Groups in Woking, England are a legacy to his life. Continuing to deliver breakthrough designs in their luxury sports cars and paying homage to their founders roots with the stylized Kiwi logo featuring as part of the design. It all began for Bruce at just 15 years of age when he entered this Austin 7 Ulster in his first competitive race in New Zealand. A hill climb at Murawai. He won it. I think the thing that was special and unique about Bruce was the combination of attributes he had. He was a, an extraordinarily successful racing driver. He was an amazing engineer who engineered all of those cars. And he was the entrepreneur and the founder of the company. And they're a set of attributes that's almost unique. Today, that would be three different people. That was one person with Bruce. And he was an amazingly charismatic and popular leader. You talk to the people who worked with him, they loved working for him. Um, that's what really founded the spirit and I just, I just like to think that spirit lives on in the company that we have today. It was while studying engineering at Auckland University in 1958 that Bruce would become the first recipient of the New Zealand Grand Prix's Drivers to Europe scheme. He would quickly establish himself with his skill behind the wheel and his engineering ingenuity in his new homeland. And in 1963 he would found McLaren Racing, the origins of an empire. Bruce's life tragically ended when testing one of his prototype designs. He was just 32 years of age. Building on aspects of his legacy, Auckland University has now established a Bruce McLaren Scholarship Programme for engineering students to intern in the United Kingdom at McLaren Automotive, and plans to establish the Bruce McLaren Centre and a Bruce McLaren Chair of Innovative Engineering. Bruce's daughter has also come across from New Zealand and now works for the company as their brand ambassador. My father originally was planning to diversify from the race car team and build road cars. He designed, built and was driving the prototype M6 GT road car, but unfortunately that project was never fulfilled after he was killed. What McLaren Automotive now are doing is exactly what he wanted to do. The attributes that my father had in a race car are well documented and well known. He became the youngest driver to win a Grand Prix, only the second driver to win a Grand Prix in a car of his own design. But more important than that for me are the other attributes around his personality, I think. He inspired the people that worked for him. He was a real leader and for me as a daughter, that makes me very, very proud that he was such a lovely man. Not only has he been a hero to his family, friends and contemporaries, but Bruce has become an inspiration to a whole new generation of young New Zealanders living their dreams on the international racing circuit. Aucklander Mitch Evans was just 16 when he won the New Zealand Grand Prix and moved to London. He has since had major success on the international racing circuit in GP3 and GP2. Now signed to Jaguar Racing and its new Formula E team, Mitch is at the forefront of the next chapter of innovation on the racetrack and his future is electric. I was six years old. I got my first go-kart on my birthday. I can remember it was just like yesterday. It was. Yeah, pretty cool moment. Got my helmet, got everything, all my kit, and uh, 
yeah, had my first race straight after that. You have to start young in the sport, like just like anything now. Um, you got to start young, go karts, and learn all your craft there, and 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 all all the basics of racing. It's still the the best way to to learn and and just to teach yourself everything because a lot of things we learn there we 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 still use now. Moving to Europe and coming onto the international stage, yeah, I didn't realise how competitive it was going to be. You know, obviously I won a lot of things back in New Zealand and in Australia, so I was expecting to come across here and not in an arrogant way, but I was I was expecting to be yeah dominant, and it wasn't the case because everyone over here is just as good as you. So uh, it does come down to a lot, you know, a lot of the mental side and and, and having the car underneath you. Um, Unfortunately, I realised that early on and, and worked even harder at it. I've been very, very lucky to get the support I, that I've had to, uh, to be able to reach my dreams and, and, and also get people on my journey that, that believe in me and you know, that makes it even more special. Mitch's family have a long association with motorsport. His dad, Owen, broke the New Zealand land speed record in 1996, something that nearly cost him his life. He had a, a very near miss in terms of, um, in terms of have been fatal for him and fortunately he's still here because you know I would not be where I am if it wasn't for dad and you sort of look past the the danger of of racing and, and the, the consequences that it, that could happen I think that's what makes it so unique and, and what what people love about it so much we do have a very very rich motorsport history and the likes of Bruce they, they put us on the map in, in the, the motorsport world and, and, and even to now, with McLaren still being one of the top teams in Formula One, that all started with Bruce, and that's very, very special. And um, I think a lot of people forget that.